I would like now to invite another Rodrigo. Rodrigo Barfield, we are going to talk more about clean energy, right? Um, Rodrigo, he is founder of LLE US in Brazil based in US, a serial entrepreneur. He has raised and managed more than 250 million in private equity commitments and has directly participated in more than 1.25 billion in infrastructure investment. LLE Brazil launched in 2015 is now one of the leading investors and developers of distributed solar energy in Brazil. Previously, Rodrigo was the founding partner of Rio Infrastructure Capital Partners, the general partner and manage manager of LRIF1 LP, a 150 million private equity fund focused on renewable energy investments across Latin America. Rodrigo's infrastructure development career has seen him living on four different continents, three in the global south. He began his private equity career as a principal investor of EMP Global in Southern Asia and the Middle East. Before this, he was a staff infrastructure finance specialist of the World Bank. Rodrigo, thank you so much for being here. No, thank you, everyone. So I, I think that, you know, that sounds more impressive than it actually is. Um, go to the next slide. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about our investment experience in Brazil. And, you know, there's some guiding principles here. And, you know, I like this first quote a lot. Pessimists sound smart, but optimists make money. It's like, good luck. Say you can't do it and go home. So and the other one is something that my grandmother used to say, and I wasn't sure if other grandmothers said this, so I'm pretty sure it's uh, <laughs> so, so, and that's mostly because I was a little fat boy demanding food all the time. So next slide, please. I can do it here. No? Okay. Um, so part of the reason that those two quotes were up there was because you have to have a lot of patience if you're going to invest in Brazil. You have to have a lot of patience if you're going to invest in any emerging market, um, especially when you're talking about private equity as opposed to public investment in infrastructure, or sorry, public investment in stocks, where you can just go into a stock exchange and buy something. If you actually want to invest equity, it means that you're investing in a business. So that's the reason that those two quotes were up there. But just a little bit about Brazil in general, and I think that this was covered well by uh, by Rodrigo. Um, Brazil is currently, in terms of GDP, um, and we're not talking about on a PPP basis, Brazil's the ninth largest economy in the world. And really, it's probably the eighth, um, if you adjust for this year's numbers. I mean, if you want to wonk out on economics, I can do that. But um, so we should be about the eighth largest economy in the world. And our energy matrix, and when I say energy matrix, I'm only referring to electricity. So I'm not referring to um, you know, fuel consumption, which is a huge part of the energy matrix. It is about 230 gigawatts, which is pretty big. Um, and the majority of that matrix is hydropower. You can't see it here, but it's actually about 48% of the matrix is hydropower. But overall, we're talking about um, almost 90% of the electricity matrix comes from renewable sources. So this is probably short of like some small countries, very small countries, it's probably the largest, cleanest electricity grid in the world. Compared to say, maybe Canada would be the next largest country that would give us a run for our money. Next slide, please. So um, I invest in distributed generation and solar, but I wanted, I know that that means something to me, it may mean nothing to you. So just to give you a bit of a background, like. What is renewable energy? That's the easy one, right? You all know what renewable energy is, that, you know, solar, wind, hydroelectric. It basically just means that energy that can come from naturally recurring sources. And what is distributed generation? So traditionally, inside of a standard grid, like you would find here in Georgia, which is a pretty backwards grid, um, you have large centralized power plants 
you have a transmission system, and then you have your home. Okay, so Georgia Power goes from a big power station, you know, let's say like a new nuclear power like Vogel, that's actually pretty good. You know, they send the power through the, through the transmission lines, it hits a distribution network, and then it arrives in your house. Distributed generation, on the other hand, is saying, okay, look, we can't rely on, you know, just this very centralized power generation, which usually comes from like, you know, these sort of traditional fossil fuels or natural gas generation because they create large amounts of base load and send it through the system. Instead, we say, we're going to collect multiple sources of generation, including from the rooftop of a home, uh, from the rooftop of an industrial facility, from small scale solar farms, you know, from battery storage, right? So the, lar the traditional structure of generation doesn't really account for this stuff. And integrate it into, you know, a holistic grid so that you say, and you notice this when you have a bad storm, sometimes the power goes out, right? In part, that's a fault of the fact that you're receiving power from a single source. Distributed generation, on the other hand, so, so let's say, for example, you have a massive blackout like we've had in the Northeast, and I'm sorry, but I've spent most of my life in the Northeast, but you have a massive blackout or a massive knockout of the power in Pennsylvania, and it rolls all the way to New York and causes a three-day blackout in New York City. With a distributed system, that's less likely to happen because what would happen is, is that one, you wouldn't trip the, trip the lines because you would be able to mitigate frequency modulation by using power from other sources in the grid. Brazil is like really advancing in this, and I'll show you in the next slide how. So small scale generation. So this is what we're focused on, is inside of distributed generation, we invest in small solar farms. And when I say small, we're talking about installations that are usually 20 to 40 acres in size. Um, you know, so five, 10 hectares in size, five to, five to 15 hectares in size. So these are, these small plants basically send energy into the grid, go to a customer. So the customers that we have in Brazil, they subscribe onto a network and then we give them a fixed discount on their power. So we say, okay, you want to sign up for our small solar farm. Here in the US, we'd call it community solar. You sign up to our small solar farm, we give you a fixed 15% discount to your power. The reason that we can do this is because Brazil has something called nationwide net metering. Okay, it's the largest net metering program in the world. No, nobody has one this size. Brazil did it. They started it back in 2012. I can talk more about it, but it's this system that allows us to go and build these fairly large scale solar farms and sell it directly to consumers. And that's a really big deal. You cannot do that in Georgia. Like you just can't. Georgia Power would never let you do that. So, <laughs> so it's, it's a big deal. And it allows you to scale up renewable energy quickly. So I'll show the next slide. So this, <laughs> how quickly? Okay. In 2012, ANEL, which is the regulatory agency for energy in Brazil, created a resolution that created this net metering program. Okay? Oh, okay, I'll do the clicker, yeah. Or the pointer. All right. So 2012, ANEL creates this resolution. This created net metering, okay? Net metering is that system where we can build a plant, sell it to the consumer through the grid. 2013 starts a financial crisis. Okay, this is how much solar energy existed in Brazil in 2012. Okay, there were some rooftops, some, there were some installations at some you know, very specific industrial facilities. I think like L'Oreal had a small rooftop installation, but for all intents and purposes, there was no solar in Brazil during this time. You know, it was just display solar. Start of the financial crisis, still nothing. Start of Lava Jato, which was, a, you know, had a major impact on foreign markets because it showed that Brazil was committed to an anti-corruption campaign. Then we start to see that there's some new 
interest in the Brazilian power sector in solar. Okay? Anel issues this clarifying resolution in 2015. I won't go into the specifics of what it was, but it basically said to people like me, yeah, you can definitely do net metering. 2016, so, so we moved to Brazil in 2015, uh, late 2015, start investing a lot of money and uh, didn't get very far. 2016 started to see a little bit of traction. 2017, a little bit more. 2018 is when things really started to take off. Um, we did our first installation. Um, first, we broke ground on one of our first projects in Bajé, which is in the very south of Brazil, and in agriculture, uh, like a, a Syria, at least a, one of a rice producer in uh, in the south. Um, and during this time, you just see this explosion of renewable energy or solar energy. This is all solar energy right here. So 33.76 gigawatts, basically between 2016 and 2023, because nothing happened here. Even accounting for the nothing here, from 2012, 2023, 191% annual growth. That is tremendous. Nobody has that. So people don't really understand like, what happened in Brazil during this time and how significant it was. People know now, you know, but now's a great time because we're selling projects. So, whoops. So, a little bit of perspective on this market and what's happening right now. Brazil is now currently, in terms of installed solar capacity, the sixth most installed solar capacity in the world. And that's as of June 2023, I think. So if you look at the countries that are above us right here, on a per capita basis, this is an extraordinary amount, right? So, you know, you have to imagine that India's got five times our population. I mean, here, Japan and Germany are a different story because that would be, you know, they would have more per capita. Um, China has obviously got the majority. And really, you can't really tell this story without telling the story of China. The reason that solar globally has increased to this level is because the Chinese government has subsidized the production of solar panels for 20 years. So, and they've made solar panels cheap. So, something that I didn't put in here, and because and, I always assume, because I'm focused on my sector, that everyone knows this, but the cost of solar panels has dropped 99% in the past 18 years. So that's tremendous, right? I mean, just it's, it's like night and day. The reason that solar energy has currently got the lowest, co uh, lowest, what's known as the LCOE, the levelized cost of energy in the world, is because of this reduction in cost. And people will say, oh, well, you can't, you know, what happens when the sun doesn't shine? It's like lots of things happen when the sun doesn't shine. You know, you build a battery, you do pump storage, you use another source of energy. You know, like, I apologize, I'm not very good. I'm not, I'm not a diplomat, but uh, <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, well, just, so to talk about like just the level of investment that's going into Brazil right now, I mean, it's tremendous, right? I mean, Brazil, you know, has, committed to investing itself at a government level around nine and a half billion dollars into transmission. Transmission's important because if you don't have transmission, you can't get the power from point A to point B. Um, you know, just tons of, uh, you know, headlines talking about the fact that DG, uh, solar DG, distributed generation, is increasing in Brazil. Um, you know, Shell, uh, you know, has made major investments there, Albioma. A lot of European companies are focused on the renewables market, not a lot of American companies. There's some American private equity funds that are focused on it, but I wouldn't say a lot of American uh, power companies. So a little bit about what we do. These are some of our plants. Um, so this was our first investment in Brazil. This is a plant in Bajé. Uh, with uh, Sierra Lista Corradini. They're a major rice producer in the south. Uh, this is another one with a uh, cement manufacturer, cement, cement, uh, seed, a seed producer <laughs> in the south. And uh, this is at a port in um, 
in Rio Grande, in, no, in Pelotas. And so those were some of the very first projects that we did. You see the relatively small, that's like a 1.24 megawatt plant. That's a little under a meg each for those. And then the bulk of our investments to date have been in Minas Shaddai. And why in Minas Shaddai? Because the state had a specific tax incentive for development of solar energy. These are all actually completed now. I mean, they're in, this looks like they're in various stages of construction here, but all these plants are completed. Our, uh, so, so this, no, 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 kind of concentrated. So we're very close to Belo Horizonte. So I know that the arrows don't look like that. The pre-construction plants are now more in the north part of Minas, closer to um, Brasilia. But here we've got plants in uh, Peropepa, Sete Lagoas, um, in uh, Caetanopolis. And uh, we have one, two in Caetanopolis, two in Sete Lagoas, one in Peropepa, and um, Mateo Slemi. So that, that's all. You know, in a helicopter, it's like, you know, you just can look down on almost all of them pretty quickly. Um, just to kind of focus on the sustainable development goals a little bit, because it's important to our investors. The majority of our money comes from European investors, which are generally more progressive than American investors. Um, you know, our investment thesis kind of hits on SDG uh, 3 avoiding pollution from thermal generation, five, employing a gender diverse workforce. This is something we're committed to on the ground and something that we actively promote um, with our investee companies. Uh, SDG seven, um, affordable, reliable, sustainable, modern energy. I mean, it's kind of a no brainer. Distributed generation is that. Um, SDG eight, I can go on and on, but you know, we are, we keep KPIs on all of these, uh, key performance indicators on all of these uh, issues because we want to track them and know that we're actually contributing in a meaningful way. We're lucky that we do distributed generation from renewable energy, so it's kind of easy. You know, we're not in a complicated sector where we really have to show that we're achieving these goals. It's kind of like we achieve these goals just by operating. So, except for you know things like ensuring that we have a diverse workforce and things like that. That's something we have to work towards internally. Um, I think uh, that's it. Yeah, these, are our, these are our offices. But we have committed for 2024, we're doing, we've committed another $80 million for Brazil. Um, to, to, up until now, we've only invested about $35 million in Brazil. Um, but we're, you know, we're growing and we're seeing increased interest. There's kind of a maturity that's taking place in that Brazilian market right now, especially in the local capital markets. So if you invest in infrastructure, debt is a key component. And we went from zero debt available in the local capital markets to a lot of debt available in the local capital markets. So there's been like this sort of increasing maturity and this is a natural effect. So. Um, we're doing better. We have more opportunities, slightly lower returns than we had when there was no when there was nobody else competing, but you know far more predictable and you know uh, far more assurable. The biggest challenge now is the same type of challenges we see here in the United States when you're working with the utility, which is letting them them letting you connect your plant, so lines and the interconnection queues, some more technical issues. But, um, but that's it. Questions for Rodrigo? You made some comments about the United States. And it sounds like, why is the United States so, I, I, I know that you got Duke Energy, you got Southern, you got this, you got this, you got this. Why are they so hesitant, besides profit, maybe it is all profit, uh, to do this? I mean, this sounds like it makes that's kind of sense. Well, the U.S. is a balkanized system, so you know Brazil's one federal system that's regulated by ANEL. The, U the U.S. is 50 states where you have multiple markets inside of each state, and so, so for example, here in Georgia, we're, Georgia Power is regulated by the Public Service Commission, which is basically like a rubber stamp authority for Georgia Power. 
So Georgia Power wants to make sure that you can't do this because if you can do this and you are competing with them as a provider of power, and the best way that they can ensure that they maintain their power is through both lobbying and making sure your power doesn't go off and that you pay as low of a power bill as you can. And they do a good job of that. You know, they really do. You know, so it's really hard to like gain the momentum. But in Brazil, they didn't have enough power and the power cost too much. So they, that's why Enel implemented this system that said, we need to encourage as much power as we can to get onto the grid as cheaply as possible. So I come down there with a discount and we're- We're, we're looking at this local thing. That was like the biggest joke in the world. It's a, it's a, it's an economic boondoggle. It was the right thing to do in terms of pursuing a carbon minimization strategy. Like you need to have a strong nuclear component. Um, the way that they sold it was that it was going to represent cost savings, but that's, uh, you know, that's, that's garbage. So I have a question for you. Um, I'm not sure you can answer this, but from my experience, Brazil uses a lot of the equipment from China. Mm -hmm. So do you see a change in, do you see an opportunity for U.S.-based suppliers to get into the Brazilian market in this solar sector? Do you think it's going to be China for the next 10 years? I see U.S. construction companies having an opportunity, but nobody makes panels cheaper than China. There's just nothing you can do. Yeah, but is it a price issue or is it an efficiency issue? No, it's a price issue. The efficiency is pretty universal at this point. Imagine a solar panel is kind of like as technologically sophisticated as a flat screen television. And a lot of the production that's associated with it is very similar. So China has invested insane amounts of money in the manufacturing of these panels, whereas we in the United States invested all the money in the research of creating these panels. So we just, we gave it away. And you know, they took it, and they should, you know? At least they did. Yes? Uh, the decision tree of, of my life, which was to be a better innovator, smarter, harder working. But when it comes down to a decision-making process of businesses, price, speed, and innovation last. Y yes. I mean, I, I think that we saw that both were happening in tandem, you know, in terms of the implementation of these solar panels. Like, China needed to ensure a way that it was going to see a minimum double digit growth annually. And they fueled this industrial complex. And it just happened to be, I think, kind of pure luck that solar panels were a part of it. It wasn't pure luck, it was smart planning on there. They, they made a bet on the future. It's like Tesla betting on EVs and the rest of the ICE manufacturers, the OEMs, saying, no you know, we'll stick with ICEs. It's just like, you're just, you know, you're betting on horses instead of cars. So um, it just worked out. It worked out for us pretty well.